This FedGov Today program is sponsored by Booz Allen DE24. On this edition of FedGov Today with Francis Rose, the data deluge comes to GSA's tech transformers, the low-hanging good for artificial intelligence, and the data roadmap at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Welcome to a special edition of FedGov Today with Francis Rose. Today featuring conversations from DE24. Booz Allen hosted DE24 recently at the Helix in downtown DC. The General Services Administration is focusing on producing data that its own teams, its agency customers, and industry partners can use to make better buying decisions for the federal government. That data works happening at the Federal Acquisition Service. Sagar Samad is Associate Chief Information Officer at FAS. At DE24, I ask him where FAS is on its data journey. Uh, we started this journey around uh, five to six years ago. Um, and uh, uh, but our primary objective of our strategy was to continuously innovate, build, and ultimately commoditize the, uh, the technology layers that form the, the ecosystem where uh, security data and cloud are converging. And the idea was to use this as a force multiplier or accelerator for the business transformation. So uh, uh, in a sense, it was uh, a, a data-centric uh, security baked in ecosystem um, that can enable the composable architecture, uh, which helps in terms of uh, uh, product mindset. So uh, on the onset, uh, we uh, FAS had this uh, federal marketplace uh, uh, I, I know how I, many of you know FAS is a is a, a more of a middle person in terms of uh, uh, the customer uh, personas. There's a customer such as suppliers, um, the agencies that use the services of FAS, and a, a contracting officer. So when we started this journey, we wanted to make sure that we have this uh, uh, product mindset. Idea was as we are building these products, we wanted to decompose that into a business capabilities. And the first layer was making sure we automate the CI CD pipeline in terms of uh, developing and deploying software. So that was the first layer from a uh, compute and storage perspective. The second layer was as we work to, uh, as we have these products needs to talk to each other, so we needed this idea about API framework. That was a second layer. The third layer, which is more impor most important, no business transformation can be done without, um, without a data. Data is where the actual transformation happens. So we wanted to create that layer above these two layers, which is a data layer. And the idea about the data layer was we wanted to make sure that any data assets or processes are discoverable, identifiable, and is present to the user in a format they could make their own decision. That's about the data-driven decisions. And that part of the data layer was built over the period of time. Just like the way you have a CI CD pipeline, it has a life cycle in order for developer to build the code, develop and deploy. There is a life cycle for that. In a similarly, data has also a life cycle. You got to find, identify the data source. Then you got to curate the data and present it in a way that the, the business users can make those data-driven decisions. So the, the notion of our uh, strategy was always been, as we build the one layer, which is a CI CD layer, you build it, standardize it, commoditize it. The next layer was the API layer, mm -hmm. the, the layer above that security layer. Now we are in a journey where the data layer is has the, at, at a given time, that we could bring any data source into the life cycle. We could bring any tool, where it's in a seamless fashion, if, if, the demand, uh, if there is a demand for it, and the users would be able to 
govern their data in a more self-service manner and make those data-driven decision-making. And, and that's where we are on the journey. But what I want to point out was the layer approach. You, nobody can start uh, at a data layer in the, in the beginning. We got to start with the cloud layer, and then you go to the security layer, and then to the API and, and the data. Because you need to, the data layer needs to inherit the layers below that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so where we are as part of the journey is right now, our users uh, at a given time can have their self-services capabilities without worrying or without uh, depending on or relying on the technology uh, uh, people in, in my organization. A couple of concepts there I want to ask you about because you use terms that I don't hear very often when it comes to this journey. One is commoditizing the data and the other is curation. Curation is one that I expect to hear a lot more than I actually do. Why are those two concepts so important to the journey that you're taking and getting you to whatever the destination is for that journey, Sagar? And so I guess the, the whole concept about is that we hear uh, uh, the democratization of AI and ML. At the end of the day, when you say artificial intelligence or machine learning, it's all about the data. And idea is if data is your biggest asset, we want to make sure uh, we give a technology in the hands of tools, in the hands of the users who are expert in the data, which are the business people. And the commoditization is, they don't have to worry about where the data comes from, uh, how to curate the data, how to manipulate the data along the way or extract and manipulate. And so those things are done from an engineering perspective. So. The, the business, the users can focus on that high value uh, where they could look at the efficiency, they could look from a mission enablement perspective. So I think those things have done because of the strategy that we put in place like six years ago or five years ago is about making those layer as a commodity and the curation of our data, which is I kind of talked about this data life cycle, everything has a life cycle. So those life cycle of the layer, it is also commoditized. So at a given time, you could be bring new data source or you could bring new tools. And the reason I'm talking about the new tool being AI and ML, you, the, 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 the ecosystem allows any tools and technology to be inserted uh, seamlessly. And that goes back to this standardization or uh, commodity mm -hmm. uh, uh, from an IT perspective. We have less than a minute left, Sagar. How do you map this journey so that you know where you are and where you want to go and how you're doing on getting to where you want to go? Uh, so uh, so, um, uh, so uh, from, from a journey perspective, I would say from a, a data enabled mission outcome, uh, where we are in this journey is we are pretty much, we pretty much know how to develop and deploy a software. We pretty much know how to develop and deploy a product. Uh, data is also a product. So from that journey perspective, where we see ourselves that uh, we are open for uh, empowering our business users to use the tools that they like, uh, access, identify or access the data wherever that resides and make sure the data is secured, uh, the data is clean and, 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 and at a given time, uh, you could use it in a, in a trust state. So those things are, uh, and from, from a journey perspective, that's where we are. And I believe that uh, uh, from moving forward uh, uh, from a mission, mission perspective, any time, uh, at a given time, any user who want to bring and you uh, leverage from AI and AML, that can happen. You can read more about data at GSA and about DE24 on today's show page at fedgovtoday.com. The White House executive order on artificial intelligence gives agencies action items for using and governing AI. Experts say one of the themes of those action items is using AI responsibly. John Larson's executive vice president, Catherine Ordun, is vice president for AI at Booz Allen. John writes, there's a lot of, quote, low-hanging good to be done with AI. At DE24, I ask him what he means by that. We have a tendency, I think, to look at AI and immediately go to the existential threat that it poses. 
And there's so many things that we can overcome in terms of sort of challenges as a, as a nation and as a world that AI is going to be so well suited to help address. And so I think about things like bending the cost curve in healthcare, something we have tried for many, many years to do, and I think relatively unsuccessfully. And so when we think about something like that, the ability to look at patterns and data and see how we can address these types of health challenges. Look at some of the models that can identify things like cancer, the emergence of patterns that lead to or predict cancer. Think about things like climate change, and, you know, really a critical issue for us, discovering the patterns within that data to unlock some of the solutions to those challenges. So I think it's important to look at this technology and frame it in the context of the amount of good it can do before we get to sort of the existential crisis that we tend to always talk about. I think because we're predominantly fearful of emerging technology. Mm -hmm. Catherine, you told me about a project that you're working on with NIH that it, John mentioned cancer and this uh, a cancer pain uh, application for artificial intelligence. Give me a thumbnail of that because it's, I think it's pretty remarkable. Yeah, so I've had the great fortune to work with the National Cancer Institute and their scientists on detecting chronic cancer pain. And this is not something that is socially good for AI. This is socially necessary for AI. And in that work, we're building really robust multimodal AI models, not just warm and fuzzies for socially good type of exercises, but really helping cancer patients with real cancer data. What that means is that from even a single smartphone selfie that the cancer patient is filming um, in the comfort and safety of their own home, we're able to extract uh, frames, the faces, um, some three-dimensional landmarks, the intonation of their voice, what they're saying, and fuse all of these what we call modalities together to be able to help and assist the oncologist or the research nurse to figure out exactly what level of pain is this cancer patient in. It's very difficult and quite challenging, but as you can see, the long-term results is really enabling a data mission for health. Mm -hmm. How much of that work it revolves around understanding one particular patient and using that patient's data as a predictive vehicle for the future for that patient, how much of it is combining all of the data for all of the patients to try to predict what somebody who may today might not even be in the system yet might experience six months from now or a year from now or some future point? Yes, um, that's an excellent question because this is a humongous volume of data. Um, the end point for this clinical trial is 112 patients. Uh, I've been lucky to work with the Booz Allen team and NIH for about three years. And we've done analysis on 29 patients, which we published in a scientific journal, as well as now we've got 80 patients. So as you can tell, we have terabytes of data for all of these cancer patients. And they're from various walks of life. When we talk about ethical and explainable and responsible AI, they are different demographics, different ages, different stages of cancer and different levels of pain. And when we train AI models in such a broad swath and diversity, what we like to say is that the ending kind of uh, the final prediction model is generalizable, meaning even if we don't see that cancer patient, can the AI model learn to help distinguish pain? A couple of things there I want to come back to later in the conversation. John, you wrote recently, we're at a tipping point where AI is permeating everything. And you talked a moment ago about how the, it's kind of human nature to be at least apprehensive about new technologies like AI. What do you advise people who are federal government leaders who are starting to roll out use cases, see successes, as uh, Catherine talked about it at NCI, but have people that they're leading who are maybe experiencing that apprehension or just outright fear. How do you help them manage through that? Yeah, so I think it's important to realize that, you know, there is a, a shift that has taken place, right? So I think we've lived through the hype cycles in the past. Uh, this is fundamentally different. Uh, I think generative AI, I would liken it to the advent of the graphical user interface for the PC. It has transformed the way we are going to interact with AI. Uh, it has given us a natural way to program AI and a natural way to consume the outputs from AI. And so I think the first thing I would say is, is recognize that we are at a shift. This is a paradigm shift in AI. Um, you think about all the troughs and valleys of, of, of um, the hype cycle in the past. This is a shift in the line up. We are no longer on that same plane. It has altered. And so I would encourage you to embrace it. This is a te technology that is truly going to transform 
Uh, I think our ability to bring uh, analytics and data-driven insights to missions. Uh, I think it's important to also lean in and educate, right? This is something that achieving innovation through this technology requires, I sort of think about three things predominantly. First is start with the problem first and work backwards. The tools are amazing. You know, we're practitioners, Catherine and I, but don't become enamored with the tools. Become enamored with the problem and work backwards from the problem. The second is embrace a uh, sort of a culture of innovation, which uh, means that you have to be willing to take risks. And that also means by definition, risk involves sometimes failing and being willing to fail. Understand that failure, celebrate that failure, but move on from that failure. Right. And so I think that's the second thing you have to do. And the third thing is, is innovation is, I think, everywhere and always everyone's role. But there probably is going to need to be an organization who champions it and drives it. And so like within Booz Allen, we have a CTO organization that we sit within. And our goal is to look over the horizon, to think about those emerging technologies and how those technologies are going to transform. We made investments around AI years ago in anticipation of where we'd be today. And I think the government should be thinking about those types of activities as well. Catherine, we have about two minutes left and you talked about ethical AI and that's a great subject of conversation in the federal community for sure. And broadly, I think across the technology community regarding AI, are the ethical implications of using AI in a setting like you described at NCI different or additive compared to in, in some other sector because of the nature of the healthcare mission or are the concepts pretty similar? I think that when it comes to people in particular, the ethical standards are much higher. Um, this is embedded even in non-AI routine biomedical types of work. So um, while it's incredible to be able to get the chance to work on the clinical trial from an AI perspective, as you might know, there are institutional review boards uh, that are required just to get the people signed up. So there's an added responsibility that whatever AI, whether we're handling the data, the types of models we're building, even our interpretation and the way that we explain it needs to fall in line with some responsible standards. You can read more about AI use cases and about DE24 on today's show page at fedgovtoday.com. The three main organizations inside the Department of Veterans Affairs are all working on programs to make their data more accessible for themselves and for each other. The Office of Information and Technology is involved with that data accessibility drive for the National Cemetery Administration, the Veterans Benefits Administration, and the Veterans Health Administration. Joe Dioria is Director of Data Analytics at VA. At DE24, I ask him what OIT's role is in that data accessibility effort. That's a question we get a lot, right? Where, where does a, uh, a service provider that is really tackling very different challenges um, focus on customer outcomes, right? So what do we do from a data perspective is that we are providing um, a federated enterprise platform and the Summit Data Platform. We're providing the um, experience and knowledge and skills to tell people both within OIT and in our business partners, hey, this is how you solve for data at enterprise scale. Uh, this is how we go out and identify authoritative systems. This is how we catalog them. This is how we build curation pipelines so that people understand when they're using a particular enterprise data asset, that it really does represent what they think it does and that it ties back to a transactional system that was very much involved in the business relationship with a veteran, their family member, a caregiver, et cetera. Because at the end of the day, we're using data as an accelerator across the department mm -hmm. to build seamless veteran interactions. You know, that's what we want to do as a service provider. We want to build great IT products that make outcomes better for veterans. That seamless idea is an interesting one to me too, because my understanding from talking to some of your colleagues at VA is that you want that to be seamless inside the organization too. It's not just for folks that are coming to VA from outside, whether it's caregivers or or uh, folks that you're, the vets you're supporting. Absolutely, when you look at the products that we're building across the department, right? Master data is important to that. Um, ensuring that a veteran only has to update their address information once with the department is huge. Uh, you know, boasts accuracy, it's respectful of the veteran's time, it makes sense in the digital age that we live in. Um, and that means that you're integrating with other service providers internally. And then that's from a transactional perspective. But then if you look at the analytics side of the house, there are 
pockets of interest across each of the administrations you mentioned, the staff offices that support them, that simply just need to know what's going on in the rest of the department to plan their, their workforce capacities, build new facilities, um, think about the impact of policy changes and laws on the rest of the department. And that becomes very much an internal play right, for, for using those data assets. So absolutely right. Uh, we're an enabler, not just for those external transactions, but to drive efficiencies inside the department. How much, and I don't, I'm not asking for specific percentages, but how much of the work that you and your colleagues do on data in OIT is strategic and how much of it is nitty gritty, really tactical stuff about data standards and the infrastructure, the pipes that move the data and so on? So, so a healthy balance, right? If you look at the VA strategic priorities, we wanna treat data as a strategic asset. And that means you have to have high reliability in the data that we curate, which means you spend a lot of time in the nitty gritty with some of those transactional systems, ensuring that they represent those business processes for the department. The Profile is a great example of that, where that is executed from my area, uh, where it's very transactional, very much master data centric, uh, but it's a key feeder into our analytic, analytics ecosystem because we're talking about all of the core data that you would think about the, about a veteran, where, they're, where they live, where they receive care, what their mailing address is, what their phone number is, et cetera. All of those kind of contact data demographics in one place that served up across the department. So that I think is a reference implementation, right, of how you do that, which then leads us to having great patterns, great you know, architectural overviews that say, hey, other teams, this is what's been successful. Mm -hmm. um, you can integrate with this because obviously it solves a need that we have across the department, but it also sh serves as a bit of a, you know, a beacon for how do you do this from a transactional practice and how do you integrate it into the analytics ecosystem? You mentioned the strategic plan, and I've talked to a number of your colleagues about it. Is that your primary roadmap to determine that you're at the place in the journey that you want to be? And how tightly is that woven to a timeline? So yes and no. I mean, obviously we publish these plans for a reason, right? It's where our leadership wants us to go, and that's informed by the administration. It's informed by public policy. It's informed by what Congress has to say, right? And, and we do that as public servants to tell us, hey, this is how we're going to do that. The progress that I think that is even more interesting for us as an organization is the fact that we do so much measurement around the experience for veterans mm -hmm. and for employees. And I think that's a, even a better barometer you know, in, in a day-to-day, -day, micro level, how are we really executing towards that strategic plan is, are we moving the needle on those experiences? Um, so there's, there's a balance there, of course, you have to have a long-term strategy, you have to have a roadmap, you have to know where you're going if you're gonna get anywhere of value, uh, but measuring it incrementally, right, in terms of not only what we're delivering from an IT product perspective, but how satisfied are people with those products? What do those feedback loops look like? Are, are they positive? Are they negative? Are they indifferent, right? Um, all of those are valuable. <laughs> And, and all of them are reintegrated into what we do. And then, of course, that's a life cycle of informing the next iteration of the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. is, is measuring those or responding to those indicators as simple as if the scores are going up, you keep doing that more of that. And if they're going down, you do less of that or do it different or is it more complicated. I think that. you have to take that into the context of the service that's being provided, uh, the external uh, factors that are, are at play, whether that's um, different changing, you know, the aging veteran population, uh, veterans coming from different walks of life, uh, things like the PACT Act that have changed the priorities for what we're tackling uh, for the veteran population. So I think it's, it's, there's a lot more calculus involved than just say, uh, we swept the floor and it's clean, so we're gonna keep doing that, yeah. right? It's more of a uh, measuring the structural viability of the building that holds that floor, and then how do we learn from that to build uh, great structures in the future, I think would be a, a, probably a little bit more nuanced version of that. What are you laying the groundwork for now that may not mature for a year or two or you know, whatever the next phase is on your data journey? So I think if you look at the VA's data journey, it really began in earnest uh, when the electronic healthcare record was uh, pioneered by the department years ago. Uh, and if you look at that journey of, hey, how do we build enterprise level reporting from across a very large healthcare system? And then how do you do that for a benefits organization? How do you do that for a place that's met, uh, managing cemetery space? providing life insurance, VA home loans, think about all these things that we do um, that, that are singular companies, right? In other places in a, in a full industry vertical. 
Um, so when we we look at where we're going long term, obviously we want to build. We we don't want to lose capability that we have today from an operational reporting perspective. But we want to get ready for the ML AI generation thing, and you can only do that with great data management. So if you don't know where your data comes from, if you don't know what it represents, you're wasting your time with AI. Um, so in the next couple of years, I think that we're going to mature those practices across the department and get them into more corners uh, to unlock more data that we maybe didn't necessarily have great eyes on. Uh, because in, in a singular reporting descriptive analytics world, probably wasn't that interesting. Taken as a whole with everything else that we know about the veterans and the departments, right? it becomes very interesting and those become additive to our, our training set for those AI solutions down the road. You can read more about data at VA and about DE24 on today's show page at FedGovToday.com. That's it for today's special edition of FedGov Today. The program returns next Sunday morning at 1030. I'm Francis Rose. I'll see you then. Thanks for watching. Have a great week.